It's no secret that the United States has a shortage of doctors. We currently have a shortage of about 20,000 doctors. But what exactly does it take to get into medical school? How has the process changed since the COVID-19 pandemic? I sat down with two deans at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School to find out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Scarlet Stethoscope. I'm your host, Ijama Unachuku. Today, we'll be talking about medical school admissions. What does it take to get into medical school nowadays, and how has the process changed? Joining me, we have two very special guests, Dean Carol Terragino and Dr. Liesl Copeland. Dean Terragino, or Dean T, as we like to call her, is the Senior Associate Dean for Education and Academic Affairs and the Associate Dean for Admissions. Except for residency and fellowship, she has been a lifelong New Jersey resident and a committed Rutgers graduate. Dr. Liesl Copeland is the Assistant Dean of Medical Education and Admissions. Her background is in program evaluation and educational research. She studied medical education at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Copeland, Dean Terragino, thank you so much for joining us. So to start off, Dean Terragino, you've been a part of the Rutgers family since the 1980s. Thank you, thank you. Actually, <laughs> it's since 1975 I've okay, been part of the Rutgers okay. family. You've been here for a while. And Dr. Copeland, you've worked around the country? 2014, I started at Robert Wood, mm -hmm. and I moved to New Jersey when I was pregnant with my firstborn, so okay. in 2002. So you've both worked in your admissions role for many years now, but what brought you to Robert Wood Johnson and what made you stay? So after a residency and fellowship, it was really family and the geography that brought me back to Rutgers. Mm -hmm. uh, what made me stay? It's really, um, it's quite an easy question to answer. I work with just an extraordinary group of faculty and staff who are as committed as I am to educating um, medical students. And it's incredibly rewarding to uh, work with people that have the same mission, same set of values, mm -hmm. and we're all really striving just to make sure we are preparing these guys to take care of patients in the future. It is, uh, it's really rewarding. I agree, really, it's the people. Our students are amazing to work with. They're such a pleasure in supporting admissions. The faculty always want to improve, and so I think staying here has been great. Additionally, it's been a fairly unique job for me, so I think that combination of working within the education, the curriculum, um, as well as the evaluation piece and the admissions piece is, it really motivates me. It allows me to see the bigger picture, and that's just, it's a unique position, which I love. And you know, it's so important to feel comfortable and supported by the people that you work with. How do you plan to recruit students that reflect these shared values? So if you think about our value statement, which, go, which is an acronym, um, RWJMS, it's Respect, Humanism, and Dignity for the Diverse Population We Serve and the Diverse Population We Are. We want wellness and resilience for all. Um, um, we want to make sure that our students are, are joined in patient care, that putting patients first, and we want to support uh, science. We really do look for the development of personal competencies in, in our selection process, and, um, and it, that happens at the application level and then at our, at our, in our interview. We're looking for um, maturity and interpersonal development to meet the core missions of this school. So I agree that it's those competencies that we're looking at and it's that growth and that reflection that the student's able to give and so mm -hmm. showing their passion through their experiences. We have a benefit of being in New Jersey. We have an amazing diverse population in New Jersey um, which I think draws the schools. So our own students are able to draw others as well because of that. Um, but it is for the applicant, it's, it's looking at how they can reflect on what they've learned, how they've grown, and what they're bringing to medical school. So, in the time you both have worked at admissions, you've seen medical education shift dramatically from technology to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, how have we as an institution adapted our admissions and recruitment process to reflect some of these changes? 
we just realized that there was a lot of strengths to the virtual interview. Everybody was forced to go to a virtual interview for a year, but after that, we stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more fair to the applicant. There, it's really expensive to travel to schools. Um, and so to be able to do that interview virtually and then come visit us when it's less stressful, when you have time to meet our students mm -hmm. and really relax and enjoy that process of getting to know the school. Yeah. Um, so I think we, we definitely want to make sure you know our school so we get you to talk to students beforehand and before, okay. but that's all through Zoom. Um, and that allows you to focus on the interview when you're in that virtual interview format. The second biggest change, and it's not really a technology thing, but it is being more diverse and thoughtful about clinical experience. So as you know, to be a medical student, a successful medical student, it's not just being intelligent and smart. You have to have a passion for the career. You really have to understand that profession and that you want to do this. So I think that admissions have been more reflective about how do, how do we look at how students explored it? How do they know what the career is about? How do they show us that they really have a passion um, for medicine? And so no longer are you doing the, it's purely I volunteered in the emergency room and shadowed. It's a much broader, mm -hmm. a range of experiences, a lot more work experience, a lot more sort of unique individual perception of how do I show that I, that I know what I'm getting into. So I think that's been a national change um, and definitely something we've embraced as we're looking at applicants. Now, when I think about that, you know, I think that not everybody might have the opportunity to have certain clinical experiences. How do you take that into account? So in our holistic review, we're definitely looking at sort of the background of the applicant as well as what all they are doing. Mm -hmm. Balance is a really big strength. <laughs> Right, and so making sure that you're able to get the grades, you're able to gain some experiences and be thoughtful about what you're presenting. I don't, I, you have to do something to convince me that you know what you're getting into because gotcha. I think that's the biggest struggle is realizing, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work and I'm not even sure I want it. Right. And you have to want it. Right, right. <laughs> so right. Yeah. sometimes it's looking more at work-related experiences mm -hmm. um, that may be clinical in nature. Sometimes it's being more reflective of how did you help your family members, um, especially with the pandemic. There has been a lot more need yeah. for that caregiving and the one-on-one -on -one and personal caregiving that may interact with the physician as well. Um, and really thinking outside the box. Now, I gotta say, I loved my interview here. I had so much fun interacting with the different professors and staff and even some of the students. I know that's partially due to the multiple mini interview or MMI format that we do here. So can you tell us more about this MMI format and why we use it? So um, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School was an early adopter of multiple mini interview. Um, I became familiar with the process from our Canadian colleagues at McMaster and um, came back from a, a field trip there and, and talked my school into adopting this w new way of interviewing applicants. And we um, admitted our entering class of 2011 with the multiple mini interviews. So it's been a long time. And what I find so important about this interview structure is that it's fair. Mm -hmm. It does its best to eliminate bias. It acknowledges the fact that um, people respond differently to different contexts, and so it gives an applicant multiple times to show their strengths with multiple different in individuals. So it's a, it's a reliable way to look at an applicant versus someone coming in and we both like each other. Maybe we like each other, but it, maybe it's not really been a fair interview because I'm just so, I've given a halo effect to an applicant, right. and so it's fair. And it has validity, it, it predicts future performance, and. Um, there's really no good studies that show that an individual interview is going to predict someone's future performance. But we know for us that uh, applicants that are selected with this process tend to be the ones that get receive the most votes from their peers to be in the Gold Humanism Honor Society. They're rated by their faculty to be more sensitive to diversity, to be more professional, to really embody the values of becoming a physician. So I've been a champion since 2010 and don't see us changing. Love it, love it. I think one of the strengths of the MMI too is because it is focused on reflection of the scenario and talking through 
those different pieces is that applicants no longer feel they have to sell themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so they really feel more confident, especially whether it's a virtual interview, whether it's in person, that they're able to talk through whatever it is we're asking them. They're able to reflect their thinking, their problem solving, their um, those, those competencies, those values in the moment, and they don't have to try to figure out how do I explain something in my application or, or how do I make up for this or that. And so I think that that we are asking them to be, to keep coming up with seven different things is actually a strength yeah. um, for, that, for the applicant as well as for us. We feel like we're getting a much better number, a better assessment having gone through the different stations. In your opinion, from the experts themselves, what is the biggest mistake that medical school applicants make when applying to med school? The biggest mistake, perhaps, comes from not taking time to really reflect deeply upon your life experiences. Um, not having the humility to know that we can always learn and grow. Um, not presenting yourself as someone that has a growth mindset. One of the biggest mistakes that applicants make is not being thoughtful about their experiences and sometimes shortchanging themselves, right? And so it, you can learn from everything and we want to know what ba passions do you have, what values are you bringing. So don't limit it just to the clinical, don't limit it just to service experiences. Think about what have you spent your time doing? What have you really enjoyed? And make sure you're including some of those in those experiences. You only have 15. Um, and 10 may be all you need to list, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but don't just put two in. It's all about the patient. And what we ask our interview raters to do when they meet an applicant is to make an inference. How will this person be with the patient? And so it's really important to pass that on to any prospective applicants that they think about what they would be like as a, as, um, as a physician interacting with patients. Truly amazing. It's been an honor having you both here. I really appreciate you guys coming to spend time with us today. And that's our show, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. For more information, you could follow at RWJMS on social media or check out our website. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Once again, I'm your host, Ijama Unachuku, and this is the Scarlet Stethoscope. See you next time.